Hello, well, I'm having great fun with a power hammer. I'm with Joel Tarr. Joel Tarr is an artist blacksmith and he produces some wonderful work. He's a very gifted artist and blacksmith, a good combination. And certainly your man if you want to have a lovely garden sculpture or some rather individual gates. Joel is going to show us a lot in this film. We're going to get to see his workshop. Joel is going to show making some designs up and we'll actually get to see quite a lot of blacksmithing. Joel is actually self-taught and he's quite inspirational actually. I was really impressed with him and certainly if you're looking for a commission he gets a lot of repeat work and I'm not surprised because he really does focus on the detail and he's a lovely chap who really is the sort of person you'd want if you're thinking about a commission for some rather nice artist blacksmithing work. Joel takes quite a lot of inspiration from various makers' movements of times gone by, but he has actually developed very much his own style. And you look at his work and you begin to see a nice theme going across it. But of course, like all of us, his style evolves with time. So let's get going and enjoy ourselves. These old uh, English style ones, it's much easier to uh, clean out as you're, as you're running, like with the, the bottom draft ones, they have to, um, you have to sort of really kill the fire to be able to get the clean get it out. out but... Yeah, because your blast is coming straight in and level at the back, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, see, uh... there's, there's a blower, what, some big blower in that box, presumably. Yeah, yeah there's a bouncy <laughs> castle blower in here, and then <laughs> uh, a sort of sliding gate to choke off the air as required. Um, it's all very uh, yeah, responsive. And that's interesting, you're using a lump of larger coal in there uh, to that's, get it uh, going. Charcoal. Oh, charcoal, right, yes, it's getting a bit of heat. It's quite light, quite light, directly in some kind of starter. Yeah, that's good to know. Because I, to be honest, I have struggled lighting coke forges many a time and thought, well, am I not letting enough, you know, air or gas? And I, I put wood in, and, but anyway, lump of charcoal, I suppose, yeah, but you've got good heat. I mean, there are plenty of people that sort of um, get, the, get the coke going straight away by using oxypropane or something. In my mind, sort of just watching expensive yes. <laughs> propane oxygen burn away, so, yeah. A little bit harder on, to my mind, but harder on the wallet than just a bit of charcoal. Is it a nice feeling, Joel, to think that you're going to leave behind a legacy, you know, where there will be nice garden sculptures, nice architectural fittings or gates and things around the country? Uh, yeah, definitely, but um, I'll tell you what, on that exact thing, I had someone tweet the other day, um, I think a gardener who followed me, um, he tweeted uh, one of my sculptures that was uh, being bought in a show last year. So I think this is one of yours. I was like, oh, that's quite nice because normally, you know, these things you you do them and then yes. whether they be something you uh, like a stock item you make or a commission, you kind of do it and then it's gone. Yes. Unless it's something you, I, there is something locally that I drive past every day. Oh, that's nice. And that's really nice. But um, for the most part, it's gone. And so yeah, when you when you see it again, it's very nice. And I. I'm fortunate I've, um, I've had a lot of repeat clients. That's, that's nice, but it's a testament to your work. But it's also, well, it's obviously you form a relationship with your clients, don't you? Yeah, yeah, work? definitely. And I, I have even, you know, had ones who kind of out of the blue texted or emailed me, you know, to say, um, oh, they were out in the garden or whatever in, of an evening and um, they had some friends over and the friends really loved their gates or. You know, so it's nice. Joel took me round to a nearby stately home gardens where there was a sculpture show and he'd sold quite a few of his pieces at this show and he was needing to make a couple more for a client so he, he's going to show us actually how he makes some of these elements like the leaves and the rose heads on these ones. They do look lovely against the garden setting and set things off very nicely. And just come around another corner and there's some more of Joel's work. And I rather like these organic seed pods. A bit unusual, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are very definitely a kind of um, catharsis for me. I've got a real interest in early 20th century design and Bauhaus and sort of mid 20th century modernism and um, just kind of making it all a bit of a mishmash. <laughs> yeah, good. There's got a slight variation here. We bring in curves on this one. These have actually got. Um, 
in comparison to the roses, more heavy kind of forge work in because um, these areas here can forge from an inch round bar and uh, sort of textured in. So Joel, this is one of your famous bits of plywood with numerous <laughs> <laughs> drawings. I like the way yeah, you've got, you got well, burn marks. Yeah, there's some welding. So I made for the sculpture show three head variations on the roses and for each one that I made, I made a, a master copy and then also made a jig to suit each, each one. This hasn't been sort of taken, um, not all the welding is complete on this one as they are, so there's you know, gaps and whatever. Yeah. Um, so when I do them for the show, they're all sort of cleaned up. And, but what I have over at my other little anvil is, uh, I'll spin it around so it's right way, is, Another jig. Another jig. <laughs> oh, it only goes in the other way. Never mind. I once did a film on truck making, and at every stage, the chap said, "Right now we turn to this jig." Yeah, and well, it, it just it became comical in the end because everything had a jig. But oh, I can see why. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's the way to, it's the way to make things financial <laughs> financially sensible. Yeah. So what I do is I get it down on on the jig, draw around it. I'll just lever that off with something. Two seconds. Draw around it, and then so I mark up the cut points. Uh, some bits I, I form um, free, you know, free, yeah, free. Yeah, so those two bits there, are case in point. Yeah, though you know, chances are, um, I, it's been a while since I made some of these, but chances are that is probably the same curve as that. So I can just use that portion there, or you know, maybe it's the same as that. So maybe I can just put it around and find oh, out. So, and then I um, mark it all up, cut them all up into their right. <laughs> sizes and then uh, bring the pieces over put them around and then spot weld them very quickly so i'm not you know burning into my jig at all and then get it off and then just like fully fully weld uh, Joel, i'm just quite amused here at your chalk sharpener because <laughs> oh yeah i have a friend who's a farrier and uh gives me all his old rock he what he says are no longer usable but to me <laughs> perfectly fine so it's just engineer's chalk um, <laughs> So what I do is uh, get this on, draw around it, and then I, uh, I mark all my cut points. So over the lines. Yeah. Yeah. So I know how far I've got to pull it around. I did actually once upon a time, I think you can see in there. I that, wondered, I could see something very faint. So actually the that's, that's the wrong way around, I'll turn it that way around. So I did stamp these to tell me how many inches of steel I needed um, per one. So one, 10, two, 12, but. Uh, Looks a bit scientific. <laughs> <laughs> it's about as scientific as I get. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good jig, isn't it? And again, you've got that fitting into your hardy hole. I, I've definitely changed my kind of taste opinions yes. as I've gone on. Um, there was a period when I first started out, I was kind of adamant not to... Tradition was boring, traditional stuff was boring, I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that. Then I started kind of learning a bit of riveting and collaring, and oh, addicted. <laughs> it's like everything. Oh, it's got to have a collar in it. It's got to have a, a ton of rivets in there, and it's got to do this. And, and you know that, and that's uh, that addiction for a while. And then you start kind of finding out a bit more about Bauhaus minimalism, and then you kind of think, well. Now maybe I don't want to forge this out that way and taper this and texture that and do this and do that. I just want to kind of see how, not little, but you know, how much I can do with a gentle mm. shape rather than, um, so, you know, <laughs> maybe in a six months time I'll have a completely different opinion, but that's, for me that's at the minute now is kind of modern, early, early 20th century, mid century, that's yeah, no, I think that's nice. I like that. That's part of the beauty of it, isn't it? Really, it's a, it is a journey. End of the day, and it's 
you go along it and you try different things and discover. None of us in life really know what is going to be going on around the corner or how things develop. It's the thing with the um, that I find is that, you know, there's a lot of work that I do, um, strap hinges and things like that, um, where the, the process for me is still completely enjoyable and I, I, I completely enjoy it. I don't have that same kind of like, yes, factor right at the end of it and especially that you know that kind of yes factor is uh, tenfold when it's uh, something that's come from your own mind so you know with art, artwork that I put into shows when someone buys it that's not them saying I want you to design me this and then make it you know they, they've gone out to a show seen my stuff and thought I've got to have that and then bought it and that's I love it when you know someone's buying into your own yes ideas oh, that much but nevertheless when you're making strap hinges or whatever it's it's still hitting hot metal it is yeah i know and some, some days I, I don't know if it's the same for you I, I know myself that i have what i call a leather belt day where i want to do something which i can do pretty well in my sleep i'll enjoy doing it but um other days i want more of a challenge and i want to do something technically more more challenging, so it's quite nice to have the, the strap hinge day versus yeah, yeah. the hard I mean, day. The, a change is as good as the rest and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah. Actually, the, the hardest thing with this sort of thing is um, keeping it all flat. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it must be easy to get it to cut upwards or get yeah. it going up wrong. Nice wide jaws, aren't they, on that? Yeah, I've got several vices actually, but I. And I used to have quite a few set up, but I found that it was a bit OTT and I didn't really use that many. Check that. As you can see now with that jig, why you made the walls higher yeah. on that inner piece, because you are, it is easier for you, isn't it? Like that. Yeah, I mean, planning these things is half the battle. Yeah. What I do with these is cut them on the angle, so rather than just sort of lopping it off like uh, at 90 degrees, there's a bit of an angle on there, so. Hmm. There he is. Gonna marry up with that. Yep. So and then. Yeah. Next nice moment of truth, Joe. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's a, it is a bit of a jigsaw, so now all cut and uh, they're staying within their lines. And um, so I've got my master copy and same so now it's a case of starting to build in some of the world um definitely mig welding for this between my my two options of mig and stick mig is just by far the best for this because you know it's a constant build mm -hmm. building up the world do you do go around it all and do little bits do oh yeah semi just, it and then go in with the full whack afterwards or? yeah yeah first yeah first it's just sort of getting it all dotted in then because of you know some the gaps you've got to build it up and then after I've um, sort of built up the weld to make it all seamless or, you know, not seamless, depending how I want it to be in certain areas. It's then going in with the die grinder and files to sort of round them up so it's... Um, Smoother. Yeah. And to get this effect at the end. Well, that's, that's actually only oh, part of it. Isn't yeah, that's, that one? Only, yeah. that's only kind of done to be held together once they're, they're done. They're, you know, the, the welds are a lot neater, mm. and especially where, the, where the, the branches branch off each other, it's kind of completely smooth. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So. so, a little bit of cleaning going on here, Joe. 
Yeah, just knocking off some of the spatter. Um, there'd be quite a lot uh, more involved in um, cleaning up and taking bits of weld out that I don't want in there. Well, first thing typically would be get wire wire wheel on the grinder. Oh yeah, twist just give it a bit of a. And then that, I find that knocks off a lot of spatter and um, can you know, help clean it up and so you can see better. And then once it's all cleaned up a bit, I can see, well, I probably want to take a bit of weld out of there or you know, just carry on tinkering around with it till it's got the kind of the shape that I want. Sometimes I want them to be, you know, blended in. Sometimes I want that kind of lead, um, that sort of, you know, lead look from the stained glass style. Yes. So sometimes I do purposely leave them proud where normally, you know, if you wanted something to be completely uh, flowing, you'd kind of grind it in smooth or file it in smooth or whatever. Yeah, really just depending on the effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's so good. That's good. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely areas in this where I kind of weld more than I would normally just to build it up to give it that. Because when they rust down, you know, the, rust has that sort of way of smoothing everything out and, you know, hiding details. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to sort of think for future <laughs> rather than like once just it's now. Yeah, 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 yeah. cleaned up and ready now. Yeah, good stuff. Got a handsome old tree trunk here, haven't you, Gerald, for your kit? Yeah, so it's been in several positions in the workshop over time. I've sort of settled on here for now. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. certainly. Well, I've got, I've got um, <laughs> any flat surface in the workshop becomes covered in junk. Um, <laughs> so I ground in this depression here so that I could straighten bars or even sort of dish shapes and things like that. Is that like where that. you did that dishing there? No, that was. Um, Actually, I think I did that under the fly press, but uh, well, normally what I do with these is kind of sand them up to bring out the texture. Yeah, it's great. But um, yeah, that, that's you can do a hell of a lot. I do a hell of a lot of cold work. I'll just grab a bit of bar. So I do a, a lot, a lot of cold work, and you don't need, you don't always need heat. So, um, for example. I've got a, a gradual curve in a bar. Yeah. Still needs to have um, nothing under it for it to be able to, you know, you've got to sort of take it past where you want it to bend to for it to spring back a bit. So um, you've got to sort of take it past. Oh, I think it was an elastic limit or something. Yeah, it's a little bit like sort of bending chair backs when you're steam bending and you have to make it a slightly tighter curve. But again, you know, so if I wanted to straighten that up, you know, you, you struggle on a, a dead flat surface, but when there's nothing underneath it, We all probably think it's like high-tech equipment, but you've just done a perfect, you know, curve and got rid of that curve. Joel's now going to show us how he makes the leaves for some of his sculptures. One of the things I'll show you what I'm doing is making some leaf blanks, which are going to be incorporated into a sort of arts and crafts style rose sculpture. I've got um, some sculptures, there's a um, larger one and also a smaller one. I've got some Don't arts and crafts day. style rose sculptures sculptures in um, a couple shows and in one of the shows they've uh, sold one and I need to take them a replacement. Gerald, you seem to manage to keep your fire burning a long time, I've which just, is um, you know, quite, quite impressed actually because I mean we've been here. Just fished out this lump of clinker, so this is um, the benefit in my mind of the English side blast forges that I've, I could um, leave the fire to cool a little bit, get my rake uh, poker end in there and lever this out in one go and chuck that in the bin, get the air flowing again. And you're back working. Yeah. It seems very economical because I mean you've got a large, you know, relatively large hot area and yet you seem to be making that run very effectively. Well this is the, air, the, the how you regulate the air blast of um, be letting it run quite hot. I mean, in theory, what you should do is get your fire up to temperature and kind of let let the heat sunk into a bar rather than just constantly mm. blast it um, to 
know, get that fire really, really going because you're just burning fuel away quickly, but also you're kind of blasting oxygen onto the vessel, which isn't ideal because this is going to cause it to oxidize more and you don't want oxides in your work. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, you can quite, you know, get pretty. Oh, yes. Yes, that's, that's quite, quite an impressive. That's just a simple gate, isn't it? Yeah, it's just a sliding the, gate. Sliding gate, yeah. No, it's effective. Wow. A, lo a lot of um, people use uh, dimmer switches, household lights, but fans, motors don't tend to like being told off like that. You know, the, 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 um, the, the sliding gate is the way to go. On. Yeah. I mean, touch wood, that was a. Uh, not a cheap, uh, sorry, that was a, that was a cheap fan of eBay. <laughs> Good on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> Joel, at the moment you've got the bars semi-prepared and they're like long, oblongy shapes. Is that, that yeah. right? Yeah, well what I've done is worked them down from 10 mil round to a sort of rectangular shape where they're uh, a bit wider on this side than that and the reason is I'm going to double them back on themselves so uh, get it hot in the middle and pull this side back around like ah, that. So that's why it's a bit thinner in yeah. the middle. Yeah. Also I have to sort of leave a bit of meat in the bar here um, because what I'm going to do when I pull it around and hammer it um, over on the anvil it's going to sort of taper on itself a bit so if I take that down too thin now it's going to not have enough mass to sort of work itself down. Yeah. I, I have fire welded them together at the ends before but it doesn't really need it to be honest. Well no, they, they look nice and at the end of the day you're aiming at an organic shape aren't you? It's yeah. Not like you're trying to get something that is we don't really want something totally symmetrical because nature isn't... Well, pff, yeah, but uh, <laughs> the thing with the blacksmith thing and, uh, well, you're always sort of, you know, you want it, it's handmade, but you're always yes. trying to get it. <laughs> Looking right. So then what I do, once I've got in that kind of V shape is I've got a couple of different sized jigs that I made. Ah. Um, so like, uh, the, the, these um, originally made for a gate that I made where I, it was um, a rose themed gate and I had quite a lot of leaves to do in that. So then I form it around this, um, depending on which size I want, and then take them over to the uh, board and uh, it's a sort of inevitable that some of these come out a little bit one way or another, sort of a bit, a bit biased to the left or right. So if it's a sort of bit biased to the left, then maybe I'll put it on this one because it's sort of leaning over. This one's actually, this one here is pretty well centered. Mm. Um, but then, especially down at the bottom here, where it's all getting very snug to fit it all in, because I don't really want that kissing onto that. So uh, where this kind of uh, stem is coming through, it's a bit eccentric over to the right. Then if I've got one leaf that's leaning over to the left a bit, I'll you know, use that there or vice versa. Um, so it's just a case of fitting them in and tweaking them as required, really. And that's really partly where the artistry you know, really comes into its own, as you're visualising this organic form, aren't you? And I mean, one the main thing I've got to do between yeah. getting from this stage into that is offering it up onto the drawing, seeing how I want it, and um, sort of laying it on top of the bar that would be in there, marking up where I want to cut through this, so that these kind of tail bits I've got my hand on, they're they're binned. That's that's yeah. That's just there for the sake of give me something to pull round, and then where it's chopped through here gets welded onto the bar there, hence the burn marks. <laughs> yes, yes. I appreciate with all of this, there's always, I know with my level work, there's a tension between doing things commercially, isn't there, and artistically. But... Yeah, I mean, and you know, so even the other day, the fair that you came to, and uh, yeah. uh, there was a guy there asking me about, I think I was talking about this process, and um, I said, oh, I do them under the power hammer. Um, and he said, oh, you cheat. Like, no, it's not cheating. No. It, no, it's it, just it, using it, what tools you've got, isn't it, really? Yeah. It's making the best. You know, you, you try doing this in a commercially viable way. So, basically, that's... Well, it's, it's not also as if there's not a lot of your skill and artistry going... You know, you're, you're adding the value by creating the item. 
and I know with myself, people sometimes criticise me for using sewing machines rather than sewing everything by hand. But if I were to hand sew every bag, it would make it beyond most customers' price point. When, when, I, um, first, when I first started um, forge work, yeah. I was quite keen to sort of consider myself as a blacksmith, and there was a lot, there's, there's a sort of um, a train of thought that you can't consider yourself a blacksmith unless you can fire weld. So I was really keen to teach myself <laughs> fire welding because yes. I wanted to be, in everyone's eyes, a blacksmith. Yeah. I taught myself fire welding, I used it loads, and then I thought, you know what, it's not really relevant to what I want to do. No. And I feel a hell of a lot more comfortable calling myself a metal artist because it, it loses you that baggage of like, you have to do things mm. in such and such a way, mm. which some people you know, give you real, you know, uh, the sort of the purest that I, I think there's a kind of defense of the craft, you know, that reluctant for it to get distorted from what they think the craft is. And in that, I think, like, we're so much freer for myself to call myself a metal artist, and then I can not have to justify, you know, well, I'm going to grind that rather yeah. than I'm going to forge that, or I'm going to MIG weld that rather than whatever, you yeah. know. But I mean, end of the day, that the result is you are making beautiful. You know, things like gates and sculptures, but which the, the, you wouldn't my, get otherwise. But my um, sort of take on that is that a lot of these tools, I mean, I don't have a plasma cutter yet, that is mm. really on high on mm. my next list of things I want, is they allow you to do so much more. Yes. And, okay, let's, you know, let's say that it's, it's not strictly um, blacksmithing, it's not strictly forge work, but there's a large contingent of, of you know, a large part of the process is forge mm. work, so mm. I'm not trying to, and I don't think anybody who does this sort of style of metal work, forge work, whatever you want, to, I, don't, I don't think they're trying to con anyone, no. it's just the nature of the beast, and yes. how the, in my opinion, the, how the craft is progressing. But well, I think it's, it, I was going to say, it's part of it, it's how you're keeping the craft alive, but you are also moving it along. I think it's kind of important as well that it, you know, you embrace this, Newer stuff. No, I, I couldn't agree more actually. And I, I know my power hammer equivalent is probably my skiving machine, which shaves leather, you know, to make it thinner. I wouldn't want to be without that machine, because it means I can make more beautiful items more quickly. I think the, the key to it, all is using the process that's right for the job. And I, I have done a lot of kind of. Um, not conservation work, but you know, people live in a, 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 a ter um, Georgian terrace and they yes. need a gate to suit their Georgian terrace. Well, in those instances, I do all the processes that are relevant and suitable to the job. But, I mean, it just so goes that my real passion is sculpture and that frees That's you right. up quite a lot of room, you know. Yes. <laughs> so if I left that like as it is, I was saying before that some orientate themselves slightly to one side. So actually, if I spin that around, you see better. Yeah, very slight. That, that one's nice. got a little. So yeah, that way, Liv. What I tend to do is get them all so they're bang on centered. Um, in fact, actually, I can see something's bothering me in that. But yeah, so sometimes I leave them so that they're um, you know orientated off to one side. It just if if they're centered. They're just a little bit more usable, you know, because you get, um, you can push push them either way. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that looks really good. It's anyway, so that's, that's, that's a bigger yes. one. Yes. I'll do a smaller one. So these, uh, these sort of blanks that I forged under the hammer, I, I did them all for the larger size, but um, there's going to be quite an excess of material left on this, but I'll make a smaller one for the sake of it as well. Yeah, that's good. Nice to see them both. It's funny, seeing this, you've got a nice, I mean, we've got the door open for the filming, but you've still got quite a nice light for seeing yeah, definitely. your colours, haven't you? I mean, yeah, I've got, I've got my workshop set up so that um, I get, I do get a, a decent amount of light coming through but I've also got sort of various lights in various areas according to what I want to do. So where I'm welding, there's quite a lot more light. Um, I'm, I haven't been MIG welding all that long. I've, I've, I've self-taught with everything. And uh, I've, 
I don't know, I feel a hell of a lot more comfortable stick welding. Yeah. And, uh, but MIG welding seems to require a lot more light. So I've even stuck uh, LEDs to my tin roof. So my, sort of the light across the, the workshop changes. That's quite impressive though, to say that you've learnt you know, everything yourself. I mean, I, it, it's interesting because, um, well again, I suppose my level <laughs> work, I've been the same, but how have you approached that? How, how have you actually, have you looked at lots of YouTube films or have you books or <laughs> yeah, is it a mixture? Uh, basically, um, books, YouTube, forums, um, that kind of, the, the great thing I like about this is that it is so applicable, you can scale things up and down. So you've got to obviously have the mentality to be able to think, okay, well I can apply this in various ways. But you know, once you've learned a bit of tapering, a little bit of scrolling or whatever, then you can just sort of apply it onto the next thing and just carry on bumping mm. it up and up. Yes. So, I mean, you don't have to know a hell of a lot of processes to get a sense how the, the material works and as soon as you know how the material works then it's game on really you yes know? yeah and i mean i i came into this through illness really um it's sort of a bit of an irony but i have uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and i came into this because i was um, at college studying to try and become a film editor followed my mum into the film business and um got ill and for years was just mm. treading water, trying to get better, you know, going from doctor to doctor, until I kind of accepted that I wasn't going to get better and I just had to get on with it. And I thought I didn't have any relevant qualifications for anything. Um, and I couldn't, uh, because of my own, this like slot in with the nine to five or, yes. you know, other people's work schedule. So I really had to create a situation for myself where I was dictating my own work and, um, I mean, thankfully, I'm most of the time okay. No, I, I know I've heard other people say about if they can even sometimes just get a couple of hours in a day to get that little gap and then, yeah. then carry on getting back on with something. But, it, I mean, you, can... you know, it, being self-employed and the kind of the guilt of not working 24-7 can um, it really cause you to get up and get on with it before you, before you feel like you should. <laughs> In a way, that's positive though, is it, at least it shows that you love your work and, you know, it's, it's fulfilling. I mean, I can see that it's, you, you do, that's great, you see that close up, it's sort of just, you know, and you get a different it changes character. the character, doesn't it? I think it should be inspiring for other people, the fact that you know, you've managed to train yourself with this. I think any, anyone who can take a craft and, and learn it and use their initiative and build it up, is, I think it's very commendable. It's well, um, part of the other end of the spectrum, the other end of the reason I came to it was that um, I used to play, <laughs> used to play drums and death metal bands, <laughs> and every band I played used to fizzle out. And um, I was basically because you know things like that are group efforts, and it only takes a, a small sort of kink in the chain for a little mm. thing to fall apart. And I thought, well, you know what, I've got to do something where I'm w working under. You know my own energy and um, control sort of, sort of thing. You know, the, however things pan out is down to me, and if it yes. all fails, then it's, it's my failure. So I kind of threw myself completely into this, and they <laughs> sort of financially left myself no other option. This, this will work. This will work. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good, it's a and, good, you know, it's a good driver, as they say. Touch wood, it's, uh... Many thanks to Joel, and I hope you enjoyed watching that. And thanks very much for watching. Bye bye.